GPT-5 is here, and in this video, I'm going to explain what it means for you as a developer and what you need to know. I'm going to talk about the three different API versions that are available, the price comparison, how, what context they have, how that compares to other big models like Claude and Gemini Pro, and I'll talk about a bunch of new features that OpenAI has released through their API, stuff like reasoning effort, preamble for tool calling, and general thoughts on how GPT performs as a tool calling model, as well as freeform function call context-free grammar, and I'll talk about migrating from previous API versions. This is going to be quick and you're going to learn a lot. If you want access to the slides from this video, you can sign up for my newsletter. Just reply to the introduction email I send you, and I'll reply with the PDF document with all of these slides in them. I'm teaching AI engineering here on Zazen Codes. Let's start with the model card. The big things that you have to know is that we have a 400,000 size context window, but this is split into 128,000 output tokens and the remainder of that context window is for input tokens. We have a knowledge cutoff with this model of September 30th, 2024. But as you can see in this example on the right, it seems to have knowledge past that. For example, it understands what MCP is without having to do a web search. And that's been something that previously ChatGPT 4.0 didn't understand that MCP was the model context protocol, at least not in my experience. And here's what I was talking about with the context size. This is a direct quote from OpenAI saying uh, the GPT-5 models can accept a maximum of 272,000 input tokens and 128,000 reasoning and output tokens. And so we're gonna talk about what that looks like for cost. But first I wanna compare the three different variants that we're gonna be talking about. First is GPT-5. This is like the main most expensive model. It compares to GPT-4.0. And so this is gonna be when you have a hard problem or you're willing to spend a lot of money and this is the standard model you would wanna use. From there, we can get into the cost optimized models. There's GPT-5 mini, which balances speed, cost, and capability, and GPT Nano, which is gonna be really fast and relatively dumb compared to these other models. Now let's get into the price comparison for these models. And what I did is I fed in the maximum input length and the maximum output token length and generated costs based on that. So these costs here would reflect a single prompt with the maximum context size. This would be like if you fed in an entire book worth of input context and got out about half of that size in output in a single prompt. Now notice how I've written uncached here. So I'm gonna expand this and we're gonna look at if we had cached input. Cached input would apply to subsequent prompts in the same conversation. So every time you ask a question in ChatGPT, if the input's long enough, if everything above it is long enough, it's caching that. So it saves some of the internal state of the neural network, which reduces costs and reduces latency. And GP, like OpenAI and other model providers pass that cost savings along to you. So you can see in this case, if we're using cached input, let's look at GPT-5 and we can see the input cost was 34 cents before for 272,000 tokens. Uh, and now that comes down to just three cents. So only 10% of the cost if we're, if we're doing cached input. But the output remains the same cost because it's not cached and it, it's charged higher as well. Output is more expensive in general. So we can see in this case, the total costs end up being comparable. Even though the input cost has been reduced significantly, the total cost of running a query like this, where we get a massive amount of output, remains relatively the same. And I've done the run the numbers on that for you. Now I'm gonna expand this to also talk about the batch API. A batch API will give you data on a delay. So you might get it like up to a day later, I think, but it saves us a lot of money. It's half the cost. And so these numbers are all just cut in half, but this will give you an understanding of how cheap things can be like two cents here for GPT-5 Nano if we're doing the batch compared to the most expensive option, which would be a dollar 30 for GPT-5. So it's very much worth paying attention to these things and trying to optimize for cost. Next, I'm gonna talk about context comparison between other leading models, Claude 4 and Gemini 2.5 Pro. Check out the max input tokens. GPT-5 is better than Sonnet. Uh, it has quite a quite a massive amount of input tokens, but it still is dwarfed by Gemini, which can take over a million, which is just ridiculous. But check out the output tokens. Um, GPT-5 is able to output more than the numbers I found for other models. 
And if if you you know if you disagree with these numbers or you think there's been a mistake, uh, let me know in the comments below, and I'll make sure to highlight that for all of the watchers of this video. Next, API features. These are exciting to me, and I've made a follow-up video to this where I'm demonstrating these in a Jupyter notebook. So if you're interested in seeing hands-on code demo, you can follow that link at the end of this video or in the video description. And the first one is reasoning effort, which defaults to medium, but there's a new option now called minimal. And this will give us a lot faster responses and it will reduce reasoning tokens. And reasoning tokens are counted as output tokens. So when the model is reasoning about something, it's thinking about something, those all count as output tokens. You're paying for all of that stuff. So minimal can help with that. But of course, it only should be used for like relatively simple problems because reasoning is very helpful. Uh, the other flag is verbosity, which I think this is super cool. I believe it's brand new and it'll re result in more succinct answers by, by saying low. The default is medium. So believe it or not, we can actually ask for more verbosity, which is, you know, like OpenAI is typically compared to Claude is like very verbose. It's about puts a bunch of stuff. I always want it to say less. So now by setting this to low, that will be very helpful for me. Next, I'm gonna talk about tool calling. So I think GPT-5 is much better at tool calling than the predecessors from OpenAI. Um, it's been a bit of an issue, I think, where Claude was really like built around the idea of tool calling. And then OpenAI came out with O3, which was really good at tool calling. And I think 4.1 was like okay at it. Those were the two models I could see in Cursor. But GPT-5, I believe, is like a very truly native tool calling model, and they're advertising it as, you know, excelling at coding, front-end engineering, and tool calling for agentic tasks. Now I'm going to talk about some of this specifics around tool calling and some awesome features of GPT-5. This, from here to the end, is a pretty exciting part of the video. I think this is the best part. So first, um, we can ask GPT to output a preamble when it's doing tool calling. And I've said if instructed, and I'm showing that in orange, as you can see, I'm saying convert four rads to arc seconds and show tool calling preamble. And because I asked it to show this preamble, now it's outputting this mess, this thing we see here in pink. It's communicating its plans. This was before it called the tool. And then down in the line below, it's actually gone ahead and called the tool. It's getting an answer. And if we saw more of this conversation, we'd see it outputs more preamble. So uh, I'd love to demonstrate this. So I'm using MCP host and I'm gonna spawn GPT-5 mini. And I've got a couple MCP tools here available. So, uh, well, a bunch of tools, but two servers. There's a random number generator MCP server and a unit converter MCP server. Uh, this, these are both my own. These are open source. You can check them out if you want. I'm gonna say, um, I'll do some unit conversions. I'll say convert four TB to exabytes. Let's try that one. Uh, so this should use this convert computer data tool. Okay, so here it's doing that. And we can see in the orange, this is some art, like some logging style data. And then this one here is the returned data. So this is being sent to the MCP server. This is being returned from it. And then we kind of parse out the answer. Uh, but now what I could say is uh, try that again, uh, show tool preamble. And this is like the new, one of the new things of GPT-5. It has this tool preamble ability built into it. So we're gonna see it. In this case, it didn't actually output anything before, but afterwards it's like, okay, here's what we just did. These are the units. So this is actually coming to the user now. And that's, that's the preamble feature. So OpenAI has this prompt migration guide. I'm gonna open that up and just give it a little go. So um, if I go to Claude agents, I have some prompts in here. I'm going to grab this Python script writer and we're going to grab that to our clipboard and just toss it in here. Okay. So this stuff at the start, we don't really, isn't really relevant, but I'm going to pretend this is like a prompt and now we can optimize that for GPT-5. And here is the result. So we have more explicit, like it's saying role, then we have instructions and it's sort of showing us some comments here. Oh, so it has the reasoning behind all of the different changes that it's made, specified UVs, package manager pur purpose. Um, this could honestly just be helpful in general for optimizing prompts. This is a pretty cool tool. 
Now this slide for me helps me understand when to use GPT-5 versus Mini versus Nano. And GPT-5 is gonna be a replacement for O3. And here we wanna use either the default medium or higher level of reasoning. It will also replace GPT-4.1 with minimal or low reasoning. And GPT Mini is a good replacement for 04 Mini, or as well 4.1 Mini or 40 Mini. Basically, if you're using an old Mini model, go to the new Mini model. And the Nano model is a good replacement for GPT 4.1 Nano. Now, if you're enjoying this video, then you'll like my AI engineer roadmap because for each section of this course, I've created an entire set of slides like these ones to talk through all of the foundational concepts in AI engineering. So you can check that out on zazencodes.com. So I've got a few things left to talk about. The first is responses API and the old version of the API like sort of method of, of talking to chat GPT models was using chat completions. They had a chat completions endpoint and SDK integrations, but this was replaced with the responses API. Now chat completions is still supported. And in fact, there's some things which are only supported on chat completions, but uh, OpenAI is moving towards the new responses API, which they released like a few months ago. So sometime early 2025. And in particular, now would be a great time to migrate over or at least make sure you're using the responses API because of this chain of thought processing that, that is passed between turns. And for, right from the documentation, OpenAI says, you know, this will lead to fewer generated reasoning tokens. So this will save you money when using the API. It will also result in lower latency. So here's an example of the responses API where we make two requests to ChatGPT. And the first one, we're looking at GPT-40 Mini and we're saying, tell me a joke. And then we ask the same model again, explain why this is funny. But notice how the input in the second case, we don't actually have the previous message, tell me a joke. Instead, we're saying previous response ID equals response dot ID. And so this is a pattern with the responses API of how we can reference. It's basically we're relying on OpenAI's internal storage of these conversations. And it's the same mechanism that's gonna help with this passing chain of thought between turns. They're, they're saving data from your conversations. By the way, you can turn this off. So if you don't want them to retain any data from your API usage, you have to specify that and turn this functionality off. But that's a big benefit, a good reason to use Responses API. Next, I'll talk about freeform function calling. This is a brand new thing that you can do with GPT-5. And here's a full example of doing freeform function calling. You can see I'm using GPT-5 Nano with the Responses API. And my request, my prompt is to do something, it, generate a bash command is basically what I'm saying. And I'm like, use this tool and let's look at the tool. It says it's a custom tool, we have a name and we have a description and that's it. I don't describe the arguments or parameters and that's the whole point of this freeform function calling. It's just gonna call this tool and it's just gonna dump in a string of text to pass into it. And so this is really clean and simple interface. And you can see the result on the right. Once I actually run this prompt, if I inspect the output from the response, uh, I see this in the, in the last element. It's like, okay, we're gonna do this function call. And this is the input, EZA-tree. It's basically generated a command. Then on the application side, we need to ingest this and feed this into our tool. If you're not completely following, then it'll be easier to follow this in the Jupyter Notebook. So you can keep watching my next video and I'll run through this example. The last thing I wanna talk about is context-free grammar. Here's an example from OpenAI documentation of how to use this. And in this case, we're using it to generate PostgreSQL that's valid PostgreSQL code. And I'll just basically quickly explain this. I believe this is a new, like new with ChatGPT 5. They've released this context-free grammar support. So let's look at on the left. This is the grammar definition and it's using this Lark syntax. And so it's got these punctuation and operators. And this is like a Lark syntax document specific to Postgres. And it's gonna ensure that anything the model outputs is valid Postgres syntax. Obviously, you can see why this would be useful because models often make syntax errors between different Postgres engines or SQL engines rather, pretty common. So the, the let's walk through the example on the right. We have a prompt, which is like, okay, call Postgres grammar, generate a query, retrieve, blah, blah, blah. So this is the description of the query. We're using GPT-5. We run that prompt. 
And then this tool section is where we're using the context-free grammar definition. And so it's for, it's the format of the tool. We have like some a description of what the tool does so that we're, we're able to use it. But we've actually even put that right in the prompt. Hey, call this tool, like very explicitly instruct, instructing the model to, to do this. And the format is this type grammar, syntax, lark, and the definition is over here. And once we run that, we can inspect the output of the response and look at this dot input field. And that's actually the post, that's gonna be the query we have. Again, I have an example where I walk through this um, in the next video. And actually this is one of the examples I'll show you where I created a normalized phone number function. And this actually just implements a regular regex syntax. So we, we're not worried about this lark syntax stuff anymore. Everybody's familiar with regex and this pattern right here I have, this, we're gonna just make sure that the output adheres to this pattern. And you can see when I inspect my re response, or result rather, um, it's given me this field, this input field, which has passed this regex test. That's pretty much what it does. It like validates output using regex. So that's it. I've talked a lot about this next video. If you wanna watch that, I'm gonna put it on the screen now. Otherwise, thanks for watching this far. I'd appreciate it if you give me a like and subscribe if you wanna learn about AI engineering from me. Namaste.